Hello all and welcome back to part 2 of reviewing the world building of the Avatar The Last Airbender franchise. Last time we talked about how the water tribes and their societies should work, so don't forget to click on that video first. And while you're at it, don't forget to click the subscribe button to make sure this channel keeps on rocking. My cabbages! Anyway, today we're going to jump into the next nation of the cycle, so let's jump right into... The Earth Kingdom. The Earth Kingdom is the one that has the greatest landmass in the entire map of the Avatar world, so it only makes sense that that is where the Earthbenders can be found. Earthbending, like waterbending, is actually a lot more versatile than one might think, as it can include a wide variety of materials so long as there's some trace of Earth in them. Regular ground, rocks, charcoal, mud, sand, crystals, apparently glass, lava, and eventually metal after Toph created it by politely insisting that she's The greatest earthbender in the world! Don't you two dunderheads ever forget it! Nah, I can't see why she's a fan favorite at all. So yeah. Earth is a very broad term and its versatility depends mostly on one's own personal skill with it. This means they can do a lot with more solid materials and it really shows. They're the nation that is most adept, for example, at creating any form of building or home, even temporary ones, and they'd frankly be much more reliable than the ice buildings and the water tribes as explained in the previous video. So much so that, yes, the biggest and greatest cities in this whole franchise are pretty easily found in the Earth Kingdom such as Omashu and the great city of Ba Sing Se. Pretty much all the things that we take for granted in our world are already implemented here. They use earthbending to easily create homes, create entire systems to easily transport goods and services, and in Ba Sing Se they even use it for trains and create the biggest, most impenetrable defense system possible with the enormous walls of the Third Ring. So yeah, I say that shelter, transportation, and defense are easily the things they're most good at, but I think we can take it one step further. Rock Surfing So, as mentioned before, the Earth Kingdom is shown to use earthbending for transportation with their delivery system and trains. Both ideas work perfectly fine by the way. And frankly, at most I'd say they should have implemented this transportation system across the entire Earth Kingdom way early on, not just with Kuvira. Although the question I have is, why don't they straight up fly with these damn things? Look, they can easily lift huge ass boulders like it's nothing, and you don't need to be a tough level badass to carve out the details. Just slice off bits and pieces until you have a platform, just hop on them and then boom, use earthbending to lift it up in the air and travel wherever you want. And even if we were to assume that you just don't have the strength to keep it way high up into the sky for long enough, they could easily just lift it a few feet off the ground and then just rock surf from there. Any bender could just have their own slab of rock, or hell just improvise it on the spot, and zoom wherever they want. Would they get tired eventually? I mean sure, but you can just take a break for a few minutes and then just continue. Not like they're gonna waste any time, as the speed in which they can shift or throw rocks around is frankly way faster than traveling by bird horses. They'd frankly be Flintstone level cars minus the sound effects. I see no reason at all why earthbenders wouldn't have taken advantage of this when it's so damn convenient. Hell, even the sandbenders attempt to do something similar by creating these ships that sail on the desert, and they use sandbending to fill their sails and push forward. And they are at least justified because, while sand can be rendered more solid, by its very nature it's more fragile unless you keep a constant eye on it. So, since Earth is more solid, why don't the others at least try something like this out? Oh, and by the way, real quick, no issues with the sandbenders at all. They're honestly the ones that make the most sense in both their aesthetic, clothing, culture, how they adapted to their environment, etc. So, yeah, nothing really to say here. They just work. I just think they're neat. But anyway, back on track. Even in Korra, after metal bending is easily much more available for many more earthbenders, I'm surprised that no one uses bending to just create little metal pods and move around with those. Not even in the future city of Zhao Fu, the city made of metal. 
Sure, cars would inevitably conserve way more energy for humans, especially with long distance travel. But come on! If you're a metal bender, there definitely should have been at least some metal pods that people would consider to be this world's equivalent of hovering shield bicycles. Although you'd still need a license for that, just in case. Oh, and by the way, don't have many other notes for Zhao Fu. It's just so beautiful. Maybe just put a little bit of extra coating on all the surfaces so it doesn't rust when it rains, and you don't get electrocuted when you touch exposed wires. But aside from that, c'est magnifique. Also, while I didn't mention it last time, I definitely think that waterbenders ought to have applied the same thing with ice and easily fly around with, like, ice boards too. Except, at least ice is very slippery and, you know, cold to the touch. Although, eh, then again you could freeze your boots into place, I guess. But either way, rock has none of these disadvantages. Hell, you think you'll destabilize and fall off? Just create rock handles and you're good to go. So yeah, while Omashu's delivery system is great, and should frankly be implemented on all carriages at this point, I see no reason why transportation wasn't an even bigger and easier deal in this world. Architecture Alright, this is a big one for me. We know that all the buildings in the Earth Kingdom are made of at least some combination of earth or rock, materials that are easily bendable. Hell, even bricks would count. And while it makes perfect sense that earthbenders would have no issue whatsoever in creating even the most grand and elaborate of buildings if they're in large enough numbers, how the hell do they maintain all of this? What I mean is, just as they can easily build, they can easily destroy. Even Katara freed Aang by accidentally shattering his iceberg with waterbending just because she was emotional in one moment. What happens if an earthbender does the same? You have one bad day, or someone angers you or whatever, and then suddenly, wham! You destroy an entire pillar that was important to the entire structure of a whole damn building. Heck, screw adults, what if kids did that? Because we see, for example, that Kuvira was a prodigal earthbender even when she was a kid, and was born to a couple of non-benders, and she could easily just burst a hole through the wall and escape whenever she wanted. And she knew what she was doing. What if your own earthbending kid had a temper tantrum or whatever and accidentally knocked down an integral part of the whole house? It's not like they're shown to be that more elaborate than our real-world homes, as shown in the comic Imbalance where we see they're made with regular bricks. And if you misplace too many, wham! The whole thing risks collapsing. Or screw that, what if you're attacked by earthbending bandits who fully threaten you with your own home? Yeah, screw the prettiness of it all, living in the Earth Kingdom in any way would actually be a construction nightmare. What the hell do you think you're doing? You scared the piss out of my entire crew. I'm just trying to help. How do I know that's the code? Where anything could change at any moment, and you're especially screwed if you're a non-bender. Although, as mentioned before, we'll definitely tackle those poor souls in a future video. So, this nation would have to implement some safety precautions. First off, in the same way we said waterbenders should have implemented even more bones from the huge sea creatures they hunted as structural reinforcement of their ice homes, the earthbenders would have to do something similar. And yes, while bones here would also work for the Earth Kingdom because they're structurally sound enough and they can't be bent, and they could be an extra element of trade, I think that they should use more often another material, like wood. Because we said before that no nation at all can bend full trees, at most only flexible vines with water bending, because otherwise any attempt at bending wood would just shatter it. And the Earth Kingdom is, again, the main source of land in this world, so there's plenty of areas where they can chop down wood from forests. Plus, as an earthbender, they can easily just plow any land that they want and make it as fertile as they please, so at least they would have an easier time regrowing forests if needed. So, once they have all this wood, they can use it for the structural integrity of their homes. So that if, say, one were to fall due to earthbending shenanigans, there's at least a slightly better chance to keep it all up. And while yes, plenty of homes do implement wood already in the shows, what I mean is that, frankly, there should be way more of them, possibly discouraging construction with regular earth. And yes, we could say that they could use metal in those cases as a substitute, but there would be two problems. 
First, the Fire Nation is technically, at first at least, the one who would be most adept at metalwork since they have the full power to melt it down and shape it as they please. So at most, the Earth Kingdom would have to trade with the Fire Nation a lot for their easy melting and welding services. And second, remember, metal bending wasn't a thing until Toph created it. So while it could have been a good material at first, from her onward, the entire Earth Kingdom would have to go to each and every home and slowly replace each structure with wooden structures exclusively. All of this because metal bending would become the new safety hazard, which would only strengthen the idea of cutting down trees even more and... Yeah, we know what happens then. My name is... <laughs> Thanks, Obama. Not to mention that, honestly, you'd have some privacy issues here as well. Because if you think about it, doors would be pretty damn useless. If careful enough, these fools can just open up a whole new hole in any wall they please. So you'd have to make sure that doors, if they exist at all, would have to be made exclusively of non-bending materials like metal and later on wood. Perhaps platinum for the really rich since metal benders can't bend that. And make sure that the skeletal structure of all these buildings is tightly woven enough to not allow room for earthbenders to just slip through, even if they earthbend an opening inside said wall. Yes, even in the Earth King's palace. Because despite there being soldiers checking and controlling every wall at this point, if you have an earthbending prisoner, they'll have just as much of an upper hand as the soldiers and be annoyingly hard to keep down. Oh, and by the way, real quick, since again, there are non-benders around, perhaps doors would become like a social status symbol for non-benders in the Earth Kingdom since, you know, it's their actual only way to get in and out of buildings. But with all that said, I still think that's not enough. So I propose that there would be one profession within the Earth Kingdom that would be so important and essential that it could become its own cultural status symbol. And that is architects. In fact, studying architecture would at this point be almost a requirement for every single earthbender around, as it could be the equivalent of an air nomad getting their arrow tattoos. A symbol that you've mastered earthbending so much, and gained so much training and knowledge about not only how to create a home, but to make sure that it's structurally as sound as possible, that you're entrusted to monitor its integrity and safety. Heck, I'd argue that architects could also function as a, some sort of police. People who would patrol the streets of every city and would be legally required to actually enter homes and make sure everything is still safe and sound. And actually end up fining any registered earthbender who would be caught having a home that has any structural damage at all. And here you thought the Dai Li couldn't be more intrusive. Although to make extra sure that this happens, we can say that any time you earthbend, unless you're incredibly skilled and careful, it would leave some sort of mark, sort of like an earth scar, indicating that the ground has been abnormally shifted in this point before, and be a dead giveaway of any illegal earthbending tampering. And from there at this point, you can even have like forensic scientists specialized in retracing shiftments in earth patterns and such. Man, being an earthbender really does open a lot of job positions, doesn't it? Another idea I wanted to add, by the way, is that since Earth is so malleable for these people, perhaps the value of their homes doesn't rely on the building itself, but more so on simple square footage. Private property for these people would be almost exclusively be based on how much actual space of ground they can own, and everything else is up to them. Thus, the wealthiest people like the royal family would have hundreds of acres to themselves, while the rest of the population have tighter and tighter spaces to work with. Not that much different from our world, not gonna lie, but my point is that the aesthetic of said buildings between the classes would be secondary. So yeah, just an extra neat little detail I wanted to add. And finally, one more thing on this note. I really think there should be a specific law within the Earth Kingdom where earthbending yourself underground would be absolutely illegal. Because first off, it would mean that anyone can just bury themselves, create entire tunnels underground, and then pop into someone else's house illegally. And third, let's be real here. 
While hurled rocks would definitely shatter your bones and kill you instantly, these fools are shown to just flip the ground underneath you and could potentially bury you alive. And if you're not an earthbender yourself, that could be one of the absolute cruelest methods of killing possible. So yes, for these reasons, I think that underground burying, or how anything having to do with burials, including grave diggers, since the Earth Kingdom would consider burial grounds to be all the more sacred, come to think of it, would be a serious danger. Possibly the biggest reason why earthbending forensic scientists would be implemented, and be something so severe that if you're caught in any way, it would give you a one-way ticket straight to Atskaba- uh, I, I mean, Lake Cloud- uh, I mean- Whatever, you know what I mean. Genomite Crystals Alright, this is another big one. Genomite is a type of green crystal in this world that has three distinctive properties. First, it glows naturally on its own, and in fact we see several points in the show, as well as the comics, that it's often used as a sort of torch or a lamp that works well even in the darkest places. Second, it has a very unique property of actually growing in size, to the point that if you wear a simple ring of it, it can grow enough to encase you in basically a crystal tomb. It's no wonder that it's also called the Creeping Crystal. Talk about a torch device. But for this part, there's a small problem. In the Korra comic Turf Wars, we see there's a group of criminals called the Creeping Crystal Triad. Named like this because they have a tendency to use these crystals as a weapon, encasing anyone who gets in their way. And their leader Jargala explains that the crystals grow whenever they touch organic matter. Which, okay, could work, if it wasn't for the third part, which proves that the second is actually a huge retcon. Cuz, remember, in the very first freaking season of The Last Airbender, the show that started this all, it's very specifically stated that these crystals are also used as... Genomite is made of rock candy. Delicious. Ugh. And, look, I get it, it's King Boomy saying it. And he doesn't exactly have his mindset straight. But, crazy or not, if you're actually eating these things for whatever reason, at the very best it would screw over your entire digestive tract, and I'm pretty sure Boomy wouldn't have reached over a hundred freaking years in age with that bod if that was the case. But at the very worst, if the crystals do grow when they touch organic matter, you're immediately dooming yourself with that very first bite because it would grow out of control, straight out of your stomach. So, comedy or not, that bite would have killed King Boomy from the start. And sure, one could say that the rock candy idea should have been eliminated from the start, and they should have actually just gone with the idea of it growing when it touches organic matter as a trigger. But if the Earth Kingdom wants to trade with this, other nations might be a little weary at the idea of having these things, because even if they do emit natural light and could be useful, if you accidentally touch them for any reason, you're done for. And if you think that that's the same risk that one would face with regular fires or torches or whatever, I would fully agree with you and that would be fair, if it wasn't for the fact that, while fire does burn at the touch, it's much slower at expanding and burning if you don't have the right materials. Whereas these crystals could grow at a much faster rate at the slightest provocation, and unlike fire, once it grows, you can't turn it off with water. It wouldn't just disappear and could risk becoming way too big to handle at a certain point, especially, again, if you're not an earthbender. The less careful you are, the worse it gets, and I don't see why the other nations would be interested in this material for trade. So, no. Sorry, comic, but that just cannot work. Also because you're kind of missing on a big opportunity here. Because these things aren't created, but naturally grow in the underground of the Earth Kingdom itself. To the point that, and this is all canon by the way, 
Ba Sing Se began as a subterranean city and they immediately found the Genomite crystals, which illuminated the whole underground areas. And when the city expanded to the surface, these crystals became an excellent form of trade. Indeed becoming a perfect source of light for any other nation who might want it, and that's specifically why we do end up seeing it in other places in the franchise. God, this is so well thought out. And in fact, if they're indeed fully edible as well, that only helps even more, as this means you can have a form of food that not only forms naturally but can keep on growing on itself and become an endless source of food. These things would be super valuable then. And at this point, the fact that it's an Earth Kingdom can make sense. Because perhaps, and this is just my own theory, mind you, the first families or whatever from like thousands of years ago could have found this and become super rich off of it and could have had enough power and influence to become the first monarchs. It would all make sense if you don't assume they get diabetes from all these rock candies. But anyway, yeah. There is still one small problem. The fact that these crystals grow at all. Because if they just naturally grow on their own, how has the Earth Kingdom, or hell the whole world at this point since we don't know its growth limits, not been fully overtaken by these things? So, here's where I would add a small fix. These are crystals that grow, and we said that it would be too dangerous if what triggers that growth was contact with organic matter, and also because if they started underground, they would have been surrounded by all these things and that would have been even more dangerous. So what can we say that instead causes their natural growth? I think it should be none other than natural sunlight. Because it would explain why they're pretty static and safe while in the dark underground. If you chop off a small piece of it, you can put it out into the natural sunlight and watch it grow to its full limit. And based on how it started from a small ring to encompassing Sokka and Katara almost completely, we can say that that is where it stops, which is still like at least a couple thousand times its original mass. And perhaps at that point, when it reaches its full limit, it solidifies itself enough that it becomes an edible glowing rock candy which can be shipped anywhere and either be used as a safe and constant source of light in other dark areas or eaten as food. Plus, even if you were to eat it before it reaches its full growth, it won't expand while in the darkness of your own gut. At most, the real issue is that Sokka and Katara were not out in the open with the crystals, so we could have just said that they would have been taken out in the sun in specific moments as a further threat to Aang to hurry up with Bumi's tests. So, yeah. At this point, the only real question that's left is, why have these crystals formed in the first place? But to answer that, you'll have to stick around for the future videos further up ahead. For now, we'll end our discussion of the Earthbenders here, as next time we will tackle the hottest next nation in the cycle. So stay tuned, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Join my Patreon if you want to support what I do here, it would really mean a lot to me. And I'll see you all in the next video. Until next time, keep building worlds.